Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, please consider subscribing and joining if you enjoy listening to horror stories. Please leave a like before we get started. Thank you for all the support. Let's begin. Are you really that desperate? Did you need to get on Tinder? That's what I asked myself when I found myself downloading the app, realizing quite what I was getting myself into. In reality, the past few years had been pretty bad. I'd broken up with my ex. It was a long story, but as a whole, he treated me awfully. He changed and wasn't the person that I once knew back in 2011. I think that really, he just didn't like me anymore. He probably found someone else and just kept it a secret from me. When I finally kicked him out of my house, I never heard from him again, yet I was kind of expecting him to beg me to take him back. That's what made me think that he actually had someone already there. He just went straight to them and became their parasite. Now being out there and trying to find a new boyfriend wasn't very easy at all. I'm not the great at talking to people and I'm not fantastic at socializing. My job means that I just sit in a cubicle all day and tap a bunch of keys. I have to say that it drives me insane but the pay is better than I've ever been paid in my life, and I have the highest paying salary in my entire family. With sacrifice comes money, and with sacrifice comes success. But I don't know how much sacrifice I was willing to take, because I wasn't about to stay single for my whole life, just for the sake of not getting out there and actually talking to guys. I feel like a lot of guys had lost confidence, they didn't really want to talk to women anymore, and most guys were just checking out of the dating scene. I didn't blame them, every girl wanted that Chad, but not every girl could have him. Once I downloaded Tinder, I started to use it infrequently. At first, it was on my breaks at work, then lunchtime, and eventually I'd maybe use it for 10 or so minutes while I was at home, cleaning the dishes, or watching some TV with my feet up. I didn't use it very seriously at all, and I think my main goal was to try and surprise myself, to see if I actually match with anyone that I found half attractive and interesting. By looking at someone's photos, you can't really tell very much. I think that nonsense saying, a photo tells a thousand lies, or a photo tells a thousand tales. Whichever one it is, I'm pretty sure that they're both nonsense. By looking at someone in their photos, one, they probably won't even look like that when you turn up to meet them, and two, you have no idea what they've actually done in their past. They could have a squeaky clean background, or they could be a criminal, drug dealer, murderer, etc. That's what horrified me the most about online dating. Knowing that Tinder was the most popular one made me feel a little more comfortable, but still, it's not like Tinder actually do background checks into everyone using their app, do they? Question mark. I didn't match with anyone at first, I'd only had it for two days. I got pretty depressed and just stopped using it for a week or so. When I went back onto it, I found that I had two matches with guys that I'd swipe right on. One guy was named Nathaniel, while the other guy was named Elliot. Both these guys were average looking, they were quite tall, Nathaniel was working at a veterinary, and Elliot was working in accounting. I know I liked both these guys based on their looks, but I wouldn't say that I absolutely loved them. I decided to message one of them. I know, that's pretty egotistical, right? A girl making the first move. Oh no, play the doom music. It took Elliot a few days to reply. I thought that he was going to reply instantly, but clearly I was wrong. 
Once he finally replied, we started talking, and then one thing led to another. I started thinking that it was time to seriously get into this date, so I proposed that we meet up and maybe just go for a meal, or even just drinks. Also, I offered the fact that we could meet up during the day and get a coffee or some lunch. At first, Elliot didn't respond, but soon as I didn't pay for read receipts, I had no idea if he'd already seen the message, or was simply busy. That's one annoying feature of Tinder, that's for sure. He took another whole day just to reply. Sure, where are we going? I felt like I was taking charge in the relationship. It didn't feel natural at all, but it was only early days, so I messaged back. Subway, 3 p.m. You know where? Question mark. I know. The one on the corner of the Osanger Street. Yes, that one. Okay, see you then. I just set myself up a date. I couldn't believe it. This was my first time in years since I finally actually met up with any man. I was meeting with this guy, and now I felt like finally, my life had potential it actually had meaning. When the day came, I made my way down to Subway. I know, not exactly romantic. However, there was something about it that caught my attention. The Subway near my downtown area is a place where you can just sit down. There are a load of benches and it's pretty scenic with a forest opposite. It's not like your typical Subway, trust me. When I finally arrived, I sat down in the parking lot and waited in my car. I was nervously looking through my phone, wondering if Elliot would just message me and cancel. I don't know why, but in my head I actually thought he was going to. I was looking all around, glancing behind me every few seconds, wondering if he was going to just walk up behind the car. Elliot didn't know which car I drove. So I'm pretty sure unless I got out the car, he wouldn't be able to tell where I was, or which car I was in. Oh boy, was I completely wrong. I was sat in my car just scrolling through my text messages, pretending to look busy, when all of a sudden, I jump in fear. I literally leap out of my seat, falling over into the passenger side, as I realize that there's a man stood right up against my window. It's Elliot. I can tell instantly the second I recover myself from throwing my body like a rag doll in fear. That was embarrassing. As I looked over, Elliot was laughing his head off. He looked like he was about to die from a laughing fit. Well, I guess this was one way to break the ice. I got out of the passenger side, composed myself, put my hair together, and tried to stop myself from turning bright red like a tomato. We did the introduction, gave each other a handshake, and Elliot still couldn't stop laughing the entire time. As we went on our date, it was sweet. He was a cute guy, kind, respectful, and the walk around the park, and the food we grabbed after, was an enjoyable time for me. I definitely wanted to see Elliot again, so I brought that up at the end of the date, and asked him if he was also interested. He said that he was, so this time we exchanged our numbers. When we finally decided that we were going to meet up for a second date, I told Elliot that it was his turn to plan it this time. I said this in a joking way. It had been a few days since the date. I hadn't heard from Elliot and started to get worried that he was no longer interested or that he was somehow acting. Sometimes, I felt like I wasn't really worthy, I felt like I wasn't enough, and I felt like people were acting around me, like they didn't actually like me, they were just friendly, because they felt like they had to be. Well, when Elliot finally reached out to me a few days later, he came up with a really bizarre date proposal. I was expecting something like a meal at a fancy restaurant in the evening, maybe another walk around the park, or another coffee and lunch, but he didn't propose any of those. Instead, he offered me to come round to his apartment and, quote unquote, chill out. What was that supposed to mean? Well, 
I think most girls, especially younger girls, know exactly what that's supposed to mean. Elliot didn't strike me as that kind of guy, but clearly, I was wrong. I'd interpreted him, well, in a complete wrong way. In the moment, I didn't turn him down. Instead, I said, what are we going to do? Question mark. He then replied a whole two days later again, saying, Chill out, quote unquote. He'd already told me that, and then I tried to push even further. Yeah, but what, quote unquote, chilling out? He took another day or two to reply. Watching movies? Watching series? Playing video games? Having dinner at mine? Question mark. Oh, so, dinner at yours, right? Question mark. Yeah, exactly. That's what I meant. Why else would you come round mine, without me serving you food as a kind, fine gentleman? He got a bit sarcastic with me, and I thought it's because I caught him out. Let's be real, this guy just wanted to Netflix and chill, and although he was cute, I wasn't really willing to do that by the second date. He set up the date for a week's time. I had a few days off work, seeing as I called in sick, so I had time to reflect and just think about what I was going to do on this date with him. I thought of all the possibilities and the worst case scenarios, what happens if this guy's a murderer, a serial killer, or he forces himself on me while we're watching a film. I did consider these possibilities, as I have pretty bad anxiety, and I also don't trust people after what happened with me and my ex. This didn't stop me from going there though, as I had small plans in place in case any of these bad scenarios did happen. It's not that I could actually do anything, but at least I'd be more prepared, and better prepared equals better outcome. I arrived at his apartment which is small, cramped and a bit smelly. That was the opposite of what I was actually expecting from Elliot, seeing as this guy was pretty nice, he was hygienic, clean shaven, nice haircut, and wore pretty nice sharp clothes. Turning up at his apartment made me not really understand what I was dealing with. It would be like seeing a guy who looks homeless getting out of a Rolls Royce or a Lamborghini. You'd look at him for a second and be like, wait, where's the real owner? No, he is the owner. He answered the door, and immediately the smell hit me. But that wasn't the worst part. As Elliot guided me into the apartment, I started to realise how much trash there was everywhere. There was food all over the floor, stains all over the carpet, and the smell was all throughout the entire apartment, not just at the entrance, by the front door where I'd been let in. Wait for it, because it gets way worse. He led me through to the other rooms of his house. They were small, cramped and stunk like hell. As well as the trash, there were a whole bunch of clothes scattered all over the floor, some of which didn't even look like they would fit Elliot, or were guys' clothing. Some looked like girls' clothing. Then I met a couple of his cats. He never told me that he even had cats. They stunk, and at first looked like they wanted to claw my eyes out. When I went to go pet them, they kind of ran off and just tried to avoid me. Me and Elliot laughed and we continued walking around his apartment awkwardly. Eventually we got into the living room, which was probably the tidiest place of them all, and that's saying something, because it still stunk real bad and had a bunch of Cheeto packets all over the carpet. Oh, stained carpet, did I forget to add that? I decided to sit down. He told me to make myself comfortable and asked me if I wanted a drink of anything. I asked him what he had. He said that he had juices, coffees, alcohol, shots, beer. I went wild and decided to ask for a beer. While I was sat in this tip, I thought why not? Go all the way right. This guy was never going to see me again, so I figured I'd just have a fun time. The night didn't really expect itself to get any worse than this, but somehow it managed to. We were watching some film on TV, 
when all of a sudden one of his cats comes and walks in front of me. It's just kind of looking at me funny with its tail up. For a while, it starts hissing at me. Elliot starts making noises like, hey, shh, no, shh. It does listen to him and kind of runs off at first, but then it comes back. This time, the cat starts shitting on the couch. It's right opposite us on the other couch across from the TV. And Elliot just glances and then looks straight back at the TV as if it's just normal. I don't know if he was embarrassed or if he simply just didn't see it. But the cat was taking a shit on the other couch and I could smell it from where I was sat. Once the cat moved away... I thought, there's no way I can stay here any longer. This is like a date from hell. I decided to go use his toilet, which was another massive mistake. I thought, come on, the toilet should be the cleanest in the entire house, right? This guy looks hygienic. He looks clean kept. I couldn't have been further from the truth. When I got into the toilet, there were human shit stains all down the bowl. There were stains of urine on the floor tiles, and the bath had mold and mildew growing all inside of it. What was worse is the tap was rusted shut, the basin was all chipped up, and the porcelain had all just worn away. The window, sealed shut, looked like it hadn't been open in years, the smell more revolting than any other room in the entire apartment. When I finally got done squatting just above the toilet seat, so as to not catch any severe infection from whatever was down there, I made my way over to the tap, grabbed a bunch of kitchen roll to cover my hands, and tried to jam the tap open. In the process, I ended up breaking the top of the tap, and that's when the water started spraying everywhere. No, wait, it gets even better. As the water spraying everywhere, I know I fucked up big time, this is something that I can't fix, so I just run straight to the door, unlock it, and start calling for Elliot to come see. When he gets there, he starts yelling, oh shit, shit. He runs straight to his kitchen and grabs a bucket, but the water is spraying upwards towards the ceiling. It isn't going down until it finally disperses after hitting the ceiling. The bucket did absolutely nothing. He ended up having to call the maintenance man for the entire complex. They got a plumber in and eventually managed to turn off the water supply to his apartment. While I was sat on the couch waiting for the plumber with him, I felt guilty, nervous, and like I was the one that had done all this. If his tap wasn't broken, then none of this would have happened. Oh, and by the way, when I said it gets even better, we had to wait 25 minutes while the plumbers got arrived. When they finally did, the whole bathroom was absolutely soaking wet. There was a flood forming in one corner of the bathroom. And even worse, as I was sat on his couch, one of his cats came up behind on the headrest and started trying to claw at my hair. As a result, the cat got stuck inside my hair and we started having a wrestle on the ground. I got so close to rubbing my face on the cat shit that was on the carpet as at this point, I soon realized that he actually just lets the cat shit anywhere. When I brought this up with Elliot, he said that he couldn't train them to shit in the litter. He tried to, but he gave up when he first had them. Well, it looks like he gave up on everything, including his own life. That's the last time I ever saw or heard from him, because I blocked him on everything. A guy I met off Tinder decided to have a full-blown asthma attack on our date. Really, I didn't understand why someone would take all those precautions, go on a date, set up Tinder, meet someone they've never seen before, and yet not bring some type of an inhaler. I had to kneel there, on the side of the edge of the sidewalk, 
and try and figure out how I could stop this guy from dying. His body was half on and half off the sidewalk, one of his shoulders was hanging off the curb, and I remember just kneeling there thinking, he's dying in my arms, and no one is stopping to help. One of the perks of living in New York is that a whole bunch of people just don't really give a shit anymore. Combine the fact that we have a huge amount of homeless, and a whole bunch of drones walking around obsessed with money and materialism, I think that this story is more of a lesson than a horror story. I'd been using Tinder most of my adult life. I'd been on my fair share of dates, flings, and bits of fun. But this date, this was like no other. In reality, we'd gone on a date to go and get some food, then we were going to the movie theatres. But, that was stopped short when my date collapsed to the floor and started having some weird seizure. At first, I didn't know what was happening, and I thought maybe he was having an epileptic shock. However, things just got worse from there. It turns out he was still conscious and he wasn't fitting, but he just couldn't breathe at all. He was trying to suck air in while holding my wrist tightly, but I could see that he wasn't able to get any air into his lungs. This made me panic, as he had never told me what conditions he had, and on top of this, I had no training in how to deal with any medical emergency at all. The first thing I thought of doing when he had let go of my wrist is to call 911. There were a couple of people stood around where we were, and of those couple people, two of them were on their phone. Another guy was homeless in the corner. They just looked and then just walked off, with the homeless guy continuing to just stare like nothing was happening. It made me feel even worse knowing that no one was willing to help. Had humanity just faded like that? Did no one really give a shit anymore? At one point, while the phone was ringing 911, I looked up at the people and said, Come and fucking help me. Aren't you gonna help? Are you just gonna stand there? When I said that to them, in a rather angry, yelled voice, they all just walked off, still staring at their phones. I guess it could have been worse. They could have just stood over filming the whole thing to try and get views on Twitter or any other stupid site on the internet. By the time I got through to someone on the phone, they were telling me that there was a couple of minutes wait. I thought that the guy was dying, I said, and that I had no idea what was happening. They asked me all these stupid irrelevant questions that I didn't know the answers to, like what's his name, does he have any health conditions, and is his heart still beating? I was so panicky that in the moment, I couldn't even answer whether his heart was still beating, yet it should have been obvious. Whilst I looked down at this guy, he was now fully unconscious, but his lungs were still trying to suck air in. I never knew an asthma attack could be this aggressive, to the point of someone actually being completely unconscious and not actually awake. I started trying to push him, hold him up off the side of the curb and make him a bit more comfortable. I had no idea what the recovery position was, and I had no idea how to give CPR or any other type of treatment to anyone in need. No one who was passing was stopping, a couple of people just stopped to stand and stare, but I had all my faith in the 911 person, and I had to wait minutes for the ambulance to arrive, which in New York is kinda bad, as it's a centralized city with links to hospitals all over the place. By the time the ambulance got there, his breathing had actually got a bit better, his eyes were still shut, but he was making these noises like he'd just run a marathon. He was moaning out in a lot of pain. It made me feel distressed, and I started trying to not cry in front of the workers. They took his t-shirt off, they took his jumper off, and they started strapping him up with all these wires. Then they started putting a mask on him to get his breathing back to normal. Once the oxygen was on him, his eyes started to open. He looked like he had come from another dimension and didn't even recognize me at all. It was terrifying, and I felt like I didn't really help him, but I did the best I could. The ambulance workers took him away, 
He went to hospital, and I was told to keep an eye out for updates. If he lived, I'm assuming he would message me back, with at least a thank you, or thanks for that. He did end up doing that, but it was three days later, so for 72 hours, I actually thought that he was dead. I thought that he had died in the hospital, as who doesn't message back the person that was with them when they fell ill to the point of being unconscious, then being taken away to a hospital? It just didn't add up. Combine that with the fact of all the New York people passing by, I've lost my faith in humanity. I took a short break from dating, as I just didn't see the point after that. Male, 21. A guy tried to catfish me. He was a gay guy off Tinder, posing to be a girl who was 19 years old. It came up as her being around 2 kilometers away, which for where I lived, was like living next door to someone. At first I started messaging her, thinking that God had sent an angel. These girls weren't beautiful like this. Had this girl been hiding from me her entire life? The catfish had done a great job of making the photos look realistic. The whole profile was believable, and it wasn't like your typical catfish profile, which is usually pretty easy to find and spot. A lot of catfishes are created by people in countries from third world that can't really talk proper English. They make mistakes in the bio, or when they're editing and stealing the photos from other people or models, they end up doing it all wrong. It's easy to spot, except this time, I'm pretty sure I was up against a pro. The guy clearly liked me and was trying everything he could to fool me, and it was working. We had been talking for a week or two, he got flirty, and then added me onto his fake snap. I didn't know at the time, but you can actually use an app which allows you to send old photos, or downloaded photos, as a red snap. Now to the average Snapchat user, this would fool them. They would think that the person just took that photo, and that that was somehow them there in that very moment. But that wasn't the case. This old creep was using the app. He was doctoring photos, editing them up, and making them look like he was the girl who had just taken them. I fell for it all, and ended up sending images of myself back. I was completely blinded by my own hormones, and eventually, I was hooked on this girl. She was stunning, the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my entire town. I decided that I was going to ask her out. I'd recently passed my driving test, so I wanted to take her out for a drive. I didn't drive anything particularly cool or snazzy, but still, I liked that idea of being free being able to go anywhere I wanted, without having to beg my parents for a lift, or take the bus somewhere. I wasn't about to take this cute 10 out of 10 girl on the bus for a date. She would leave me instantly, and I knew that for certain. When I proposed meeting up, she seemed to be extremely hesitant. Well, we know why. Because it was a catfish, that didn't even have a plan in place to actually meet me as of yet. Seeing as I was the one that had now fallen for the trap, I continued to push more and more until eventually, the girl, slash pretending to be the girl, decided that they were going to agree to meet up with me, and that I could drive them around on a date. I had arranged to go grab milkshakes and then go on a night drive, but when I turned up to this guy's house, everything didn't work out. I thought it was the girl's house, and as I drove up outside, I waited. I was nervous, extremely nervous, but no one ever came out. Eventually, the girl, slash guy pretending to be girl, ends up calling me. 
The voice is really hard to make out, and it seems to sound like a small girl trying to tell me something. It sounded like an eight-year-old. Something didn't sound right at all, and I immediately hung up the phone. I sent texts back saying, hey, what's going on? And then eventually they reply saying, sorry, I'm at my cousin's. I'm babysitting. I can't come out. I'm not at my house. Can we do tomorrow? My heart sank when I read those text messages, but I had no choice to simply go along with it and agree. Okay, no problem. What time tomorrow? And with that, I left the house and drove back to my parents. I went back in my room that night feeling defeated, as if I had been let down or rejected by the girl. Even then, I was starting to think that maybe this was an excuse to get out of the date. But... The next day came and I turned up at the same house. This time, someone did come out of the house. But it wasn't a girl. It was a guy who looked to be in his mid-sixties. He had a whitish beard, massive pot belly, and he was wearing a pair of slides as he walked down his driveway. I looked at him and thought, Oh, this is just an angry neighbour coming out to have a massive go at me for why I've parked by his driveway. But no, he comes up to my window, which I had slightly open, leans into it with his awful garlic breath, and says to me, Hi Simon. How are you? I look at him, my eyes widen, as I suddenly shut the window, ignite the engine, and hit the gas. With that, I think I sped off at over a hundred miles per hour. I didn't give a shit if I lost my license. I had just been traumatized for my entire life. When I got back home, I deleted him off of all of social media. I then reported him to the non-emergency line, and I went online and reported him up as a catfish. I even put his address in everything. I knew that if I wanted to catch him and stop him from doing this, then I had to do that. I had no other choice. That's my story of being catfish using Tinder. I don't think it's very common, but every once in a while there's usually catfishes that are shit at what they do. They're extremely easy to spot, and usually, for the reasons I stated at the beginning of the story, people won't waste their time progressing because they know it's someone fishing them. Susie! Susie! What the hell was my dad doing? I was at the park, chilling with my friends, when out of nowhere, I hear my dad yelling from the bottom of his lungs. I turn round, I felt embarrassment come all over my body, as I realised that now my dad was probably going to show me up in front of all of my friends. My crush was here, my three best friends were here, and five other people that went to my school and were in the same year as me were about to watch my dad give my ass handed down to me. I couldn't even believe it. I got straight up. But then I realized as my dad came towards me, he wasn't angry. In fact, he seemed happy. I knew my dad pretty well. I can read his body language. And the second he came over, he was a couple of steps away. And he looked like something good had just happened. Susie, guess what? Me and your mum have booked a holiday. We're going, and you have to come with us. Dad? What's going on? I looked at him confused, wondering why he had been like this. Dad had never come up with spontaneous holidays like this ever in his entire life. And now, out of nowhere, he just randomly did. Where are we going? Florida. We're going to Florida. Now get your stuff ready, get in this damn truck, and we're going. Sorry guys, he says while waving to all my friends, and turning back round to jog back to the truck. My dad was 300 pounds, he could barely run with his bad knees, 
and there I was, watching him do it. Something had gotten into him, and I liked it. I wasn't embarrassed the slightest. I turned to my friends, and even my crush, and said, Well, see ya. I don't know when I'll be back, but I'm off to Florida. I gave my three best friends a hug, waved to my crush and blew him a kiss, and then made my way to the truck, which dad had already started driving off in down the road. When I made it home, mom and my younger brother were packing the suitcases. I thought at first someone had died, but then I remembered we had no family in Florida, we had no reason to even go there. Something just wasn't adding up. What was with the spontaneous holiday? I later came to find out that my dad was actually using time to get off work. He was using this time as his sick pay because he hadn't had time off for a whole year, so his work told him that he can take two whole weeks off and they'd still pay him. I didn't understand sick pay until I was older, but that sounds extremely cool and now it all makes sense why dad was so damn happy. It took us a whole night to get all our stuff together. We took clothes, I brought my makeup, and my brother bought a bunch of weird things that weren't really needed. We had four suitcases in total, my mum's, my dad's, mine, and my little brother's. Once we got done packing everything up, we made sure the doors and windows were all shut and locked, and then dropped our dog off at our neighbor's house. The drive across the country took us three whole days. I don't know why dad would find this a good idea, but clearly there was something there that he wanted to see, so we did it. Another thing I realized was that my birthday would be in only a few days time. I completely forgot. It was my 18th, and then I realized maybe dad was doing something special for my 18th. Maybe it was really that of a big deal for him. Well, that was good for me, I guess. But I still liked the idea of spending my 18th birthday with my friends. And that I obviously wasn't going to do. When we arrived in Florida, my dad had booked an Airbnb for the whole family. It was a house similar size to the one we had back home. We settled in and made ourselves comfortable. And for the first few days, we spent our time at amusement parks go-karting, crazy golf, and museums. To say dad was making the most of this holiday would be 100% facts. He was going nuts. We ate out every night for not only dinner, but also breakfast, and sometimes even lunch. Three meals a day is in restaurants. Money, money, money. Dad was spoiling me. I was just waiting for the bad news, expecting to hear that something really bad had happened. My dad never did this, but as the days of this holiday went on, nothing ever came of it. My 18th birthday came around, and my dad ended up buying me an iPhone 9. I was over the moon, it's exactly what I had been begging for for the past year. I couldn't wait to get online. I wanted to get Snapchat, I wanted to get Instagram, I wanted to get Facebook, I wanted to get Tinder, I wanted to get everything. The first thing I did after setting up my phone, which by the way took ages, is I went onto all of the different apps, and I downloaded each of the most popular. By the time I had done this, I spent another half a day registering and getting on to each one. Registering to some of the apps was way easier than others. Some of the apps you didn't even really need to register, other than make an account with just a name or something simple. Whereas other apps would require things like your number, your address, your details of your date of birth, your name, etc, etc. That was a bit more tiresome, but it was definitely worth it if it was an app that my friends had and that I wanted. College to me had been extremely difficult the past few years. I didn't like going there, and overall, my dad thought I was more intelligent than most of the people in my school. I took tests way earlier than I should have, because I was passing most of them. When I was taking college tests as a 15 year old, I knew that something wasn't right with my brain. I didn't find the test hard at all, and got everything right except one mark. This told me that I had potential, but being an academic girl came with its flaws, being called a geek, being called a nerd, 
and just having people make fun of me, that was the downfall, and I didn't like it. That's why I hung out at the skate park. That's why I would chill out with my crush, the cool kids, and the popular ones. I tried to not be picked on. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. I think if I was ugly, then that would be it. I would definitely be picked on, 24-7. By the time I'd set my phone up, I had around 10 apps. I started adding all my friends... If you're wondering why I did this, it's because I hadn't had a phone. I wasn't allowed a cell phone until I turned 18. My dad was extremely strict with how he raised me, and that's why when I first saw him at the park that night, I thought that maybe he was going to go nuts at me, probably ground me and just throw me in my bedroom to rot for the next week. Once I got the phone, I felt like I was free. I instantly got on Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and I started messaging all of my friends after I add them. By far, my most exciting one to add was Tinder. The idea with this was to see all the cute guys in my local area, and even better, I wanted to find out if my crush was also on there. I hadn't yet asked him out, and as of my knowledge, he didn't have a girlfriend. I hoped he didn't and I was 90% certain, or I'd say 95%. Once I downloaded Tinder, put in my cell phone number, and all the details that it asked me on the setup, I decided to see who was in my local area, currently in Florida, where I was on holiday. There were so many hot guys that I couldn't believe it. I started swiping right, and before I knew it, I started to get lots of matches, the matches of these guys were like dopamine hits. I felt like a goddess. There were so many guys giving me compliments that it felt powerful. It felt fun. And instantly, I started messaging a whole bunch of them back. I got talking to a guy named Sam. We ended up meeting up on the second week of me being in Florida. My dad was really difficult to get off my chest. He was trying to ask me who I was meeting up with. I told him that my friend who lived where we lived in the States was actually visiting also. He was drunk when I told him and I managed to sneak out the house. Dad was treating this holiday exactly how a holiday should be treated. He was going insane. Well, I used this to my opportunity. I met up with Sam who was 23 years old. Maybe a bit older? I don't know. He looked way older than he was. That was for sure. Sam drove, and I didn't, and I didn't like the idea of just walking around. I had done plenty of that for the past five years at the skate park. Walking around with my crushes and my boyfriends was boring. Being in a car seemed like a cool idea, even if it wasn't some type of a nice flashy one. I still just wanted to be able to drive places. I met up with Sam, I got in his car, and the first thing I noticed was that I didn't like him. That may sound weird to some of you, but the pictures and the real life Sam didn't match up at all. Knowing this, I just instantly decided to try and get out the car. That didn't bode so well with Sam, as he tried to lock me inside of it, saying that we hadn't even started the date yet. He was basically holding me kidnapped, and there's nothing I could do. I went along on the date and tried to message my mum, I knew if I told my dad about this, he'd most likely turn up and end up killing the guy, making himself put in prison for years. I decided to message my mum, but for whatever reason, the message didn't send. Where Sam was taking me, there was no signal. He kept driving, and we must have been driving for around 20 minutes. He noticed that I was on my phone, and yelled at me to put it back in my pocket. I did exactly what he told me to do, as I felt scared, scared that it would escalate into something way worse. We arrived at a house and he took me inside. Inside of the house were three other guys roughly his age. They were just crashed on the couch smoking some weed. They were watching a film or some type of cartoon. It was really bizarre. I wouldn't expect guys in their 20s to be watching kids cartoons. Maybe they're high and they just found it funny. I don't know. Some of my friends back at the park used to smoke, 
and they used to laugh at the dumbest of things. Sam took me to a bedroom, and he proceeded to undress himself. He never once did anything weird. For whatever reason, he just walked around the bedroom naked. Maybe he thought that I'd be attracted to it, but the whole time I kept my eyes down. At this point, I still had my V card, and I wasn't looking to lose it to this guy that I didn't find attractive. Once Sam walked up and down the bedroom, almost like he was a model on a catwalk, he ended up putting some different clothes on. Once he got dressed up, I realized that he was starting to put a suit on. He put his blazer, suit pants, white t-shirt, and even a tie on. Then he put some smart, polished shoes on that looked like they were for a dinner date. He then took my hand and asked me if I needed the toilet. I said yes and he guided me to the toilet in the house. When I went to the toilet I tried to call my mum but for some weird reason there was no signal in the house. It must have been something to do with the fact that we were far away from the nearest city. He had driven me at least half an hour away from where I was staying with my family and I didn't even know where I was. All I knew is that there were a lot of fields, a whole bunch of forests, and not very many houses or people. It's the kind of place that has all those back roads with the stop signs. There's no junctions or highways. There's no traffic lights or anything like that. It didn't seem very busy out here. Kind of like country life. Once I finished going to the toilet and trying to get some signal in the bathroom, I realized that my original message to my mum hadn't sent, so she had no idea where I was. He started banging on the door. Hey, are you done in there? Hurry the fuck up. We're gonna be late. I got scared of him banging on the door. I unlocked it and made my way out into the lounge. When I got out there, his friends were still crashed on the couch. One of them was completely asleep unconscious while the others were just staring like brain-dead zombies at the TV, still playing children's cartoons. Sam took my hand and guided me out to the car again. This time, he forced me into my seat and did up my seatbelt. We drove for another couple minutes and this time came up to some weird gas station diner type place. It was a place that would sell greasy burgers, or at least that's how it looked. It was 8pm in the evening, we went inside, and it turns out he had actually reserved a table, seeing as he knew the people that worked there. One of the waiters was a young guy similar age to him. He instantly recognized Sam and said, Yo, bro, we got you over here, man. Sam, this way. Sam then grabs me by the wrist forcefully, in such a way that I thought was surprising, considering the members of the public were watching us. He didn't really seem to care what they thought and just sat me down at the table. The one thing I did like about this guy was his confidence, but that doesn't somehow overdo the fact that he was doing some seriously illegal shit right now and I didn't want to be there. When we sat down, I was right. We had greasy burgers, so much shit that I couldn't even name it. Most of the food we had was covered in oil, it was disgusting. I pretended to like it and said thank you to the waiters. I was kind and I kept calm the whole time, knowing that that was the best thing to do in the presence of a psychopath. To think that Sam got all dressed up for this place was kind of funny, but right now wasn't a laughing matter, that was for sure. Once we got done, Sam ended up leaving. I left with him as he held my wrist tightly again and pulled me to the car. Then, he took me all the way back to the place he met me, which was down the lane from where I was staying. When he got there, he turned the engine off, and I thought, okay, what's he want? I instantly recognized the place, because I knew it. I'd been there a week already with my family, and I'd been playing with my younger brother down that lane while we got bored and weren't out. Sam got out of the car and came round to the passenger side. He opened my door and guided me back out again by grabbing my wrist. He then looks down at me. He towered over me and I'd say I came up to his shoulder at most. He said, kiss me now. He then took me by the throat and began kissing me. It was forceful and I felt uncomfortable as hell. The guy looked way worse than his photos and he now had awful greasy burger breath as a result of the dinner we just ate. 
After suffering with that kiss, I ended up being sent on my way, with him then jumping straight back in the car and speeding off. When I got back to my parents, the text ended up sending to my mum, I immediately deleted it with embarrassment, knowing that WhatsApp would delete it for both of us. My mum never saw that text, thank god, but that wasn't the end of Sam. As the second week ended, we head back home, we drove for another couple days and stopped off at a motel during the first night. When we got back home, there was a weird car waiting out front of our house. I didn't recognize it and neither did my mum or dad. When we pulled up on the drive, we all got out the car and grabbed our suitcases. When I looked down at the car, I realized I recognized the guy sat inside. It was Sam. He turned to look at me out the window and I felt like I was going to fall over. I started to feel really lightheaded and scared, and in that moment, I noticed he start the car up and just drove off. My dad came round and wondered what was wrong with me. He thought it was just a random person parked up at the side of the street. But, deep down, he didn't realize what I knew, and that that was Sam, the creepy guy I met on the Tinder date. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for making it to the end of tonight's stories. If you enjoyed them and you're new here, consider subscribing to stay up to date with all of my videos. Here on this channel, I upload brand new horror stories every single night. Also, please leave a like. It really supports the channel every time each and every one of you leaves a like. At the moment, we're currently achieving between 2 and 400 likes per video. This is fantastic, but ideally, I'd like to hit that 1000 mark. I think it's possible eventually. It only takes you guys half a second to reach down and turn that thumb button either blue or red. If you're using your phone, it'll turn red. If you're on the app, it'll also turn red. If you're using a laptop or PC, it will turn blue. Thank you guys, and as always, don't forget to comment down below your opinions on any of the stories, give your advice to the people in the stories, and also criticize the stories. Do you have any experiences similar to these? Also, do you have any horror stories of your own? Send them into the email and the link in the description. Lastly, please share my videos. You can share them with your friends, family, communities, social media followers, forums, group chats. Please, please, please help me try and grow this channel. I work hours every day and I am actually in an independent horror story channel. I'm not with a network or a corporation. It's just me. I'm a guy in my bedroom who just makes these videos and I work extremely hard to bring you guys them. So please continue to support my channel, tuning in every single night, leaving those likes and those comments, and also go one step further and share the videos if you can. Thank you guys, and I'll catch you in tomorrow evening's video.